Uh, welcome to the panel, A Seat at the Table, The Power of PIPOC Women Illustrators. I'm Elia Jones, and I am a blogger and library assistant located in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm really excited to lead this conversation today with these four amazing illustrators. And we are going to start by talking about what this panel is about. So I'm just going to kind of read the general idea of what we're discussing. Um, in the 84 year history of the Caldecott Medal, a BIPOC woman has never been named the winner. Why not? We will explore the experiences of women in children's book illustration and how the intersections of race, class, and gender play a role in what illustrators are recognized and given major awards or are featured on library shelves and collections across the country or are even published in the first place. Um, the illustrators will share personal stories of the women artists who continue to inspire them and they will also reflect on ways to increase access and equity for other women artists. So just as um, a few notes before we introduce our illustrators, I wanted to mention the phrase BIPOC. A lot of people might not know what that means. It means Black, Indigenous, and POC, just for your info. And I wanted to also mention that, you know, I want to recognize that winning awards isn't necessarily the end goal for all creatives, right? We, as creative people and illustrators, you know, we create to put ourselves out there through our art and to also, you know, you all create for children, correct? I believe, like that's what you're doing it for and who you're doing it for. But, you know, that being said, there's no denying the power of winning awards that are both um, state awards, national awards, and international awards, because they can affect our career and they also can give you all the chance to put your work out into the world even larger, right? So I just wanted to mention that before we start. Um, so let's go ahead and do some introductions. Start with Kat. Do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Kat Min. My actual Korean name is Yu Kyung, but a lot of people don't know how to pronounce that, so I just put Kat Min, which is much easier. <laughs> I wrote and illustrated the book Shy Willow, um, which is coming out in February uh, 2021. I was born in Korea, raised in Hong Kong, moved to the States uh, when I was 14. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody want to go next? I can go next. Okay. Hi, my name is Kaylani. Um, I'm an illustrator and I've illustrated When Aiden Became a Brother, Magnificent Homespun Brown. I have a couple other books coming out. I reside in California and currently I'm in the master's program at UC Davis for design. Maybe Juana, you want to go next? Sure. I am Juana Martinez Neal. I am the author and the illustrator of Sonia's Rainforest and La Selva de Sonia, and also Alma and how she got her name and, and I'm a Komoto of Sonombre. I both write and illustrate picture books. I illustrate more than I write so far. <laughs> I was born and raised in Peru, in Lima, Peru, and then moved to the U.S. when I was 23. So I guess I'll go. So my name is Katya Chen and I illustrate picture books. The most recent one is called The Bear and the Moon. I was born and raised in Brazil um, to Taiwanese parents and, uh, you know, arrived at illustrating picture books sort of in an interact way, but I did go to art school and now I full-time illustrate picture books. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that this is a conversation. So if at any point you want to ask me a question, you know, um, about working in libraries or being on the awards committees. I served on the Caldecott, the 2020 Caldecott. Go ahead and ask me. This is open. Okay, so we're going to start. The first question I have for you is the route to publishing can be very rocky for Black, Indigenous, and POC creatives. There's been a lot of steady progress in the publishing industry, you know, but I can't help but think about the countless stories that we've lost to the slush pile over the years. Can you share how you came to work with major publishers? I, uh, I first, um, at first I, I had no idea how to get a book, like a children's book published, because I knew I wanted to write the story, illustrate the story, and get it out there, but I didn't know how to start, like where to start. So I first got an agent <laughs> because 
I knew that if I had someone who had the experience and knew the industry, that would help me a lot. So I got an agent and then and after that, I submitted to a few publishers. This one publisher, because they already had like a very similar like character and the setting and that author was also Asian. So it's just like, okay, we already have someone like that. So it didn't work out. You know, somehow fate led me to uh, living in Kurido. They liked my story. They liked the drawings. Um, and then it just worked out. And then it, it, I just felt very lucky because I think it was just timing too. It was just that they were able to see my work. It was not easy. It was not easy because, yeah. you know, it was just a lot of learning about how this whole process works and just getting to yeah. this point now. It, was, it just took a very long time. <laughs> Well, you kind of touched on some things that I think a lot of people have experienced, mm -hmm. those barriers, right? Those mm -hmm. roadblocks of, of knowledge that you have to mm -hmm. learn, but also coming up against walls where people might say, well, we already have one blank. Mm -hmm. And especially being a Black Indigenous PLC person, you know, that's something that I think a lot of creatives hear um, mm -hmm. when they're in this industry. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else want to, to add into that question? I, I went to art school because I thought I was going to be a painter. <laughs> my, my father was a painter. My grandfather was a painter. So I thought I would be a painter too. And I, I, very young, I was doing illustration. I just didn't know it was illustration. And I was always attracted to illustration. I just didn't have a name for it. And, and being born and raised in Peru, we really didn't have illustration you know as a career they were cartoonists and and that's as far as you went I mean so and, and the other thing is I did not grow up with picture books so my knowledge of this career just did not exist in my mind so when I go to art school uh, at the end of my third year they tell me that I'm not a painter that I'm an illustrator. And, and that's when I kind of get confused because I really didn't know. I mean, it's clear I didn't know because I ask them, so what does an illustrator do? And they tell me, <laughs> I always say this story because it's really funny. Um, they tell me illustrators paint backgrounds for the theater companies. And at that point, I knew that was not what I wanted to do with my life, but I did know that I needed to take a break from art school. So I supposedly took a one year break and came to the US and it's, been 26 years now uh, but when I come have a huge break for like 10 years but I meet my husband who went to school for illustration <laughs> and he kind of hand me and shown me show me what it was what I could do he was the one who told me you can do picture books so thanks to him I'm doing what I'm doing and that's amazing because I could have lost who I am you know right. if I wouldn't have met him just like I met him, I think a lot of my work had a lot to do with being at the right, at the right place at the right time, because I never thought, first, I had Alma that I had to sell, but I never thought that Alma was going to go very far. I just thought, who's going to want to buy this book? But I was just, I, I found the right publisher. I got a lot of support, and then the book did well. I did not have the barriers because I did not know them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's how that's how my story went. Not to say that it was not difficult to get to where I am, but I do have to say that it's thanks to the work of Rafael Lopez and Yuji Morales that I thought I have a place in picture books. So, so I kind of did everything a little bit backwards. Mm -hmm. um, whenever it came to not getting lost in the slush pile, um, I was really like lucky to get the support of a lot of women teachers within like my community college and then my undergrad. Um, not all the teachers were as supportive because like the majority of academia, especially our academia is, you know, white <laughs> for the most part. So I had some teachers who pretty much took me under their wing. My teacher, Rachel Smith, she sent a book that I illustrated later on when I showed her when I was an undergrad, she sent that book to somebody at Chronicle who was actually a part of the HR department and that person came through really clutch and ended up showing that book that I did the book dummy with the 10 like finalized spreads he ended up showing that to an editor so then the editor contacted me and was like this book we are not really sure if we would purchase this book right now but we have projects in mind for you 
So after we got into contact, I asked one of my teachers in undergrad, her name is Lisa Brown. She's super awesome. But I asked her, well, what do I do? Because I've never signed a contract or anything and I don't understand any of this jargon or lingo. It just seemed super inaccessible to me and I felt really overwhelmed. So Lisa was kind enough to introduce me to her agent, Charlotte Sheedy. Um, Charlotte is just an amazing woman, like overall an amazing woman and activist. But Charlotte was the one who actually ended up taking me under her wing and she became my agent. And since then we've just been inseparable. But that same book that I've been showing people since undergrad finally got purchased just now. And I feel like it's probably going back to like the stuff that Kat was saying earlier about fulfilling the boxes. And mm -hmm. there's already so many books out here like this because my book was also a book about black hair and body autonomy and being touched. And there was like a wave of books that came out at one point with like that. And there needs to be much more. There's never going to be enough of that story because it's not like every single story is the same anyways. But yeah, it's crazy to see uh, the progression of that just because, I don't know, I feel like that's one common thread that unifies a lot of like BIPOC illustrators and writers is getting turned down repeatedly until you mm -hmm. finally meet someone who recognizes that your story and your voice is of importance. Yeah. And I didn't get that recognition until I met like another black editor. It worked out just super slow and super- it Took bad. a while, yeah. <laughs> the, the journey was long to get there, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, you. thank you for sharing that. I think it's it's interesting because for me, like I I didn't actually venture into art school thinking that I was going to graduate and become a picture book illustrator. Just like um, Juana was talking about, I didn't grow up with many picture books. You know, after I graduated, I actually worked full time at an animation studio for a little while doing color styling, which is kind of just. <laughs> It's not really the most fun job because you're just, yeah, it's like color by numbers. It's just not really that fun. But, um, and that was my weekday job and I saved a lot of money. And then on the weekend, weekends, I would work on my own art. So the thing that I think I would say to other artists who are struggling is to put your work out there no matter what state it's in. Because even though I was only working on my own, own art on the weekends, I had a website and I put it out there. And from my website, I mean, honestly, it was just this miracle that happened where Kate O'Sullivan, who's a senior editor at Hope Mifflin Harcourt, saw my website and sent me a manuscript to consider out of the blue. I got the manuscript. I had no idea what the heck, you know, this was even about. I thought, you know, a lot of my work is narrative by nature because I just have always gravitated towards oral traditions and telling stories. Mm -hmm. And... So it kind of, I, the, the pairing seemed natural, but it wasn't something that I connected a dots with. Um, but she sent me the manuscript, I read it, and then she said, you know, are you willing to do one piece of art for free just to kind of see if you, if you know, <laughs> if you, what you're imagining for this book? And I was really afraid to not um, have another opportunity. And so I, I literally dropped everything and I gave her the piece like overnight. <laughs> I was just like, here, like a full painting, you know? <laughs> And I think that probably surprised her. <laughs> then she gave me, that became my first book. And then um, the second thing that happened to me that was really lucky um, and also something that I would recommend is um, I joined the SCBWI, which I think is a huge resource. I couldn't recommend it enough. I attended the annual conference. And that's, again, something that I think I will really recommend. And obviously, sometimes like these things are cost prohib prohibitive, you know, and I'm really hoping that those walls will eventually get broken down and there are ways to kind of enter into that sphere um, for all. But, but I was able to attend and um, me attending, I participate in portfolio contests. I say like always participate and I happened to win. And so then I met my now agent and then they led me to working with other major publishers. And to be honest, I think that that's always the question, like, how do I get to meet face-to-face? -face? I think SCBWI is a really good way there, you know, it's a good bridge, so. Thank you. So kind of, you know, we kind of started talking about um, the movement of diverse books and the increasing numbers of these, this type of representation in our industry. Um, so my next question is kind of, since we're talking to librarians, we're gonna kind of turn it to, to think about the role that librarians have in our industry. So what would you say to 
award committee members who are increasingly reading more diverse books. You know, they're being sent books to their award committees. And what would you encourage them to remember as they are evaluating all these titles, you know, and some that might not reflect the lived experiences that they have, and these titles might not have the same narrative and visual structures that they're used to. Like, what would you encourage these librarians and community members to remember as they're reading these types of books? I would encourage uh, these librarians and community members, if they're feeling some sort of disinterest or being slightly off put by uh, narratives that aren't similar to their own based off of like identity politics, I think that everybody has those biases that they've been cultured to have. The problem is that people really need to sit with those dis like the discomfort and those feelings and question where the root of that is coming from. Because there's not really going to be any way for a person to connect genuinely with a story that has like nothing to do with them and their identity if they don't first question, you know, why am I feeling this way? So if someone's going through books and reading them, whether it be giving to give people awards or recommendations or create displays for their library, anytime they feel something uncomfortable or they feel a little like nagging voice in the back of their head that's telling them, you shouldn't read this or you should be ashamed of this or this is different or weird and I don't feel good about it. They just need to sit with that feeling and question it mm -hmm. and then follow up with more research and read more of those types of books to try to, I guess, challenge and combat those biases. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for that. Cause I think it's sometimes it's important to encourage people to sit with those feelings, sit with them and reflect, right? You know, that's how we grow. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in for that one? Just to jump on that, what Kalani was saying, which is really important to be with the discomfort, because I think that growth is in the point of discomfort because it's something that's not familiar to you. It will be uncomfortable to kind of get familiar because there will be a sense of, well, I don't know if I'm going to speak about this correctly. There is this whole like, you know, this growing period of, of becoming familiar with the languaging of things. And, um, and also the other thing is that I think it's important to, to, to remember that, you know, if you're a single reader looking for a picture book, it's okay to measure a good book by what you like and don't like. But as a member of an award committee, there is a context for judging a book that goes beyond per personal preference. So it's important to remember to pause and check biases for that reason. It is such an immense responsibility, you know, because as we spoke about before, awards are culturally significant and they can, they do have the power to shape the future of America, you know, American culture. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about really, you know, really understanding that responsibility. Picture books, um, they tend to, like people tend to look for books that are comfortable and, you know, something that's like happy, doesn't encourage anything that's, you know, that makes the kid question things, you know, things like that. Um, but I think it's so important, like um, what's been said now, it's important to get the uncomfortableness out there and, um, and for kids to be exposed to these subjects to these topics and um, have them think for their own selves and kids are smart they you know they can think for themselves they they can figure it out and um, if they have a question you should lead them <laughs> um, you know to uh, figure it out on their own um, and also I also wanted to say what uh, librarians should remember I think like especially when you see the author's name you can tell kind of get an idea of their background just by looking at their names <laughs> so like don't let that deter you or um, even like the art style is not something that you're familiar with don't let that be like okay this is different you know maybe we need to put this in a particular kind of category it's hard to read a book without any bias because you grew up with all these things you know you know I, I grew up with a lot of um, by like things that I have to unlearn, I'm still unlearning. It's, it's, it's a process. But I yeah. think, yeah, I think the important part is to remember that kids are smart <laughs> and it's, it's important for them to read uncomfortable things and think for themselves. Not only are kids smart, but like our industry is, is visibly changing. So mm -hmm. we're getting more of these books. We have, like Kehlani said, we have a lot more work to do, but luckily we're kind of in a renaissance where we're getting more perspectives. And so no matter what, things are changing. 
you know, so some of us might have to change the way that we think and view art as well, right? Ivana? Yeah, I have three things to add. One, keep in mind that we are as uncomfortable as you as librarians where you're facing those, you know, that not understanding, not knowing, not, not having the right words. I mean, we have, we daily, I daily go through that process. I am scared too of making a mistake. So that's something that is very natural because if we don't know, we need to learn and learning is not an easy thing. It's a process, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think children need books curated in some way. I think children have the questions and parents who are not white are having these conversations daily. We are in my house and we are a biracial home. My husband is white, I'm not. My children are having these conversations and they post these questions every day. My daughter is seven and she's doing it. So mm -hmm. she's as capable as any child in the US to do it. It's just uh, most of the time white families feel very uncomfortable to face these situations. And then three, I think that but this is not a comment, but a question. <laughs> it's like, why are we feeling uncomfortable? Because we don't have that in our lives. So what we, what this is showing is that we need to open up, uh, open up and have a broader amount of a bigger, a more mm -hmm. varied group of people who we love and who we talk to and who we understand. So those are my three comments. Thank you. That's really powerful. That's a lot to think about. You know, like what can we do to be better for our kids, right? That's why we're doing this mm -hmm. for the kids. I've been exposed to a lot of picture books and I noticed later, um, now that I'm older, and uh, when I started to get into picture books and children's books, my the characters that I would draw all had like light skin. And I, I didn't catch that until later. I'm like, why do I keep drawing characters with light skin only, you know? And I realized it's because when I'm younger, when I was a child, all the picture books that I read, they all have light skin. That has become like the norm that it's like, obviously the main character has light skin. It's important to have more different <laughs> characters in these books so that kids, when they grow up as adults, they don't think that obviously the main characters are all light skinned. It's like, we need to keep learning that anyone can be the main character, anyone could be the protagonist and it doesn't always have to be like about their identity it doesn't always have to be about like a cultural thing you know about like aiding in the unlearning right yeah yes and, um changing the default mm -hmm. changing yes. the default mm -hmm. of, of what we're used to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that is something that i've really been trying to cope with whenever it comes to conversations with like editors and creative teams because I, yeah, this, my experience as a children's book illustrator, I feel like has been heavily like affected and impacted by, uh, like Kat was saying, like things, like biased things that I had been exposed to as a child that I actively myself have been doing the work to like undo and correct whenever it comes to like m mainly self stuff, never projected on outward people stuff, but like my value and my place in like spaces that are not welcoming towards me and I feel like specifically with colorism within picture books I've found it like super like weird and nuanced and interesting having like conversations with creative teams that have like POC people and who are non-black and then white people mixed in but no one really giving any input on the experience of black people specifically like uh, cutie pox or like black like women or just in general like black mm -hmm. women and like a lot of my conversations have been about colorism uh, specifically just like suggestions on well could you make this child look a little bit lighter so they look more like this parent or mm -hmm. maybe I haven't seen a child look like this before like what was like the reasoning behind making these certain choices with the facial features and it's it's difficult because it's like it's tiring it sounds yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Tiring. it's like exhausting, exhausting. it's exhausting yeah. and yeah. it's hard it's like people are expecting a lot of bipoc women 
Um, people are expecting a lot of yeah. black women and yeah. it's this thing of constantly not only having to like create material that's meant for teaching children stuff creating like visual structures that's meant for like i don't know like the direct the audience you want to directly impact but to even get to that space yeah. you have to go through editors who are also like questioning your existence and why you're in this yeah. space as well without even knowing it sometimes right which right. is the hardest part because it's hard to like have conversations with people who are really trying their best and being polite but at the same time, still having microaggressions and oppressing you through emails. <laughs> yeah. I think that perhaps these these asking for lighter skin, it's conscious. I mean, it's, it, it could be so subtle that you're not even aware that you're asking for that. But I automatically understand it as that because I understand right. colorism, being born and raised in Peru. Right. You know, it's very... <laughs> You, you experience it every day, right? Yeah. And, uh, but, Katya, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, Juana, I think that I, you know, there's colorism, I think, within the Asian community as well. And I think that, you know, I, I have many personal stories around that as well. And, um, you know, it's really scarring. And I think that, like, what we're talking about really is that there is a system that is oppressive, right? And then there are people who are, you know, who have stakes in the system who are holding it. One of the things that becomes really important is that not only are we talking about diverse folks, we're talking about the people within the system too, and who are we supporting and how are we supporting it? And one of the things that, that really came to light for me as I was, you know, sitting with these questions is that, you know, it's really important because the messaging is not just that oh, we now have more diverse books, so we, our job is done. It's like, well, right. what we're really talking about here is that we're still sending the messaging to kids that if, if the BIPOC creators are not, are, are in such a small margin, you know, like a percentage right. still, then the kids, you know, are still going to get authors and illustrators who are mostly cisgendered, mostly white, and mostly male coming to their schools. And, you know, what is the messaging there? It's saying that kids of color to kids of color that publishing is not for them, you know, while at the same time, they're reading books that say all are welcome. It's just, it's not enough to support characters in picture books and even talk about that. You know, it's, there's a whole other problem thing, right? That we're talking yeah. about, you know, beyond just, um, it's a whole system issue. Yeah. And, exactly. and there, there really needs to be, you know, a bigger conversation about creating a path to publishing for the next generation of BIPOC illustrators by supporting BIPOC illustrators now. And that and have them have a voice, like a strong voice in the industry, you know? Right. It's uh we have to encourage people to walk the walk, you know. We need diverse books, diverse books, we're getting more books, but people have to really be about this, be about that life, as they say, exactly. right? Because yeah. it, there you go. <laughs> right. Because it, it matters for our children, you know, and as you all were talking, you know, I was thinking about the thread that runs through all of this is white supremacy. White supremacy is looking at these manuscripts, looking at this art and saying, I think, and it, it affects both not only white people, but also BIPOC, it's insidious, you know? So Katya, as we talked about, you know, the systems, the systems are what we have to change, you know, for our children. Um, so I think I'm gonna kind of move on to thinking about like who influences us. I would like to ask you, can you share a few women artists, whether they're illustrators or, or not, working in children's literature, who inspire you in your work? The illustrators and authors that I'm inspired by are Samara Cole Doyen. She wrote Magnificent Homespun Brown and is just amazing with words and really great at poetry. Uh, Char uh, Cherish JB, she's an illustrator and she's based in Georgia, but she does amazing comics, especially like diary and slice of life comics. Mm -hmm. um, Love is Wise. Uh, yeah. Love is does uh, amazing illustrations. Oh, I'm so good. Yes, I'm I in love with her. her. Even her name, I'm like, wow, you were born to do great things. Right. So her and then Shannon Wright, she does like a bunch. Of, she's really cool in person too. Super nice and awesome fashion. And then... Um, <laughs> She does comics and also kids lit. And then my final person would be um, Tomi Adeyemi. Yeah. Um, really great fantasy work whenever it comes to YA. And then also amazing fashion and her brother makes great music. So those are my recommendations. 
Oh, also one more thing. I would like to plug Woman Who Draw. Um, that's an amazing oh, okay. plan by contemporary artists. I am the coordinator over there. So um, please check it out. Everybody, there are categories of women and other people who, because Women Who Draw is also inclusive to gender non-conforming people, trans people, um, the, LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community in general. Uh, right. But there are a lot of contemporary artists on there and we try to um, update the submissions regularly, so. Nice, thank you. Yeah, so Kehlani, I love Women Who Draw. I love it. I think it's amazing and, you know, the, the, the founders are amazing. Like, I just love it so much. And um, I wanted to piggyback off of that because, you know, one of the things that, that I decided to do during this year, the pandemic, is that, um, you know, I was just thinking about how to raise awareness, how do, how do we actually help um, people find, you know, um, diverse talent? And not everyone's going to get marketed. And there's so many books that are worth um, promoting. Um, and so as I was thinking about it, I decided to launch a, an online platform called a thousandworlds.org. It's a working beta that's online and we're working on the full launch with a bunch of other functionalities. But basically what it is, is that is a directory of BIPOC picture book creators and BIPOC created picture books curated by BIPOC leaders in the publishing industry, librarians, BIPOC librarians, reviewers, editors, market, marketing team, and it's completely free and anyone can use. And um, it's intersectional and it's basically essentially creating a village for supporting BIPOC creators and their books and make it easier to find people, you know, within that. So, so there's an immense pool of talent right now. Um, I think we have up to 68 books and we are actively asking um, BIPOC librarians to contact us with their favorite books so we can add to the directory. Um, but that's, that would be, you know, the answer to the question of like, where are really amazing um, illustrators and authors? Wow, we got some really great resources out there. <laughs> that's encouraging. <laughs> I, I thought about women's work, women who make art that I love. So that's mm -hmm. how I approach it. So the first one, it has to be Rebecca Dautremer. She is a French illustrator that I absolutely love. She's my favorite illustrator. Then Isabel Arsenal, Erin Stead. I love the work by Marie Cassatt. <laughs> and then I love the work by Augie Mora also. Jen Wang, uh, she's a great cartoonist. And Yer Surumi, she, uh, she's been, uh, she was my professor at SBA, um, and she's a great mentor, um, and also a cartoonist and picture book artist. Yes, those people <laughs> have been inspiring to me um, because they're kind of similar to what, what I want to, you know, make. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. I just wanted to say I appreciate being here and sharing this space with all of you. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you to all the librarians who will be watching this. I hope you got a lot out of it. And I kind of just wanted to finish up by plugging your books, because I thought that'd be a good thing to end with. Yay. <laughs> the Bear and the Moon is already out. It came out on September 29th. Pick it up. Shy Willow is the next one out. It comes out on February 16th of next year. So keep an eye out for that. Zania's Rainforest comes out on March 30th of next year. And finally, The Little Things comes out on April 27th of 2021. <laughs> oh, thank you everyone for joining us and take good care and be safe.